Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, Sacred Geography, and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update Sunday, November 13th, around noontime, Mountain Time 2022. The global seismic activity level has reached an all time high, the highest all year. So we're keeping a close eye on it. But the big story, looming storm could deliver snow from New Mexico to Maine. It's insane. Keep calm. It's boom time. Now it's not going to be a particularly big storm, but it's going to be chilly across the entire 48. In fact, Alberta has been so cold that it smashed 30 records with temperatures not seen in over 100 years. You can see that deep trough the meridional flow dipping down from the Arctic all the way into the central U.S. And this is for early this week. This is the pattern that's going to line up and bring some light snow to, well, many, many people. Snowfall Monday through Tuesday from Indianapolis to Oklahoma City. Local storm max 10, up to 10 inches in Oklahoma City, but the average is going to be around 1 to 3 for most people across the country. By Tuesday and Wednesday, it's going to move east and affect the entire upper Midwest all the way out towards the northeast. So we have those models in just a moment. Now skiing and boarding season opens early this year as snow hits major resorts around Lake Tahoe. Say it ain't snow. Shut up, Al. Get in your hole. He just woke up. Mainly quiet weather today. Chilly temperatures for many during the next few days. A rather quiet weather is expected for most of the contiguous U.S. today with only scattered light precipitation in the form of snow and some light rain in a few areas. Otherwise, below normal temperatures are likely to prevail for much of the country during the next few days and even weeks. By Monday, rain, snow, and mixed precipitation will develop across parts of the southeast and Mississippi Valley, northward into the Midwest and Ohio Valley. So heads up, we've got freeze warnings out right down here. And that is not normal. Birmingham, Alabama with some freeze warnings. So bring in your sensitive plants. Don't lose them. And click on your county for more info. Now let's take a look at the snowfall from this event and walk it through. So by Monday morning, it's going to start snowing in my neck of the woods. Colorado, it's going to move through the panhandle of Texas into Oklahoma, and Nebraska, and a little bit of snow in Kansas. But the biggest pickup here is Oklahoma. It's going to be snowing in North West Arkansas, as well as most of Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, North Dakota, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Well, you're picking up what we're putting down. The entire Northeast should get a little bit of a bump from the storm, especially Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. Then the lake effect will kick in next week. And holy macaroni, we have a wintry system for the U.S. and a cold one. Let's move this back here to today. Right here, and let's take a look at this cold plume. It's going to stay pushing down all the way into the panhandle of Florida. 36 degrees there for Monday. And then here's your cold on Tuesday. Look at that freeze pushing all the way into Texas on Tuesday night. Or Tuesday morning, I should say. And we, this is going to be one of the first extremely cold pulses for the entire southeast. Look at this free, Look at this freeze line here for Thursday morning. Pretty impressive. And it's going to also mean it's going to be chilly in North Florida while this event unfolds. By Friday, Florida will be the coldest with freeze, freezing temperatures reaching the panhandle of Florida by Friday, November 18th. This is no joke. Take a look at some of these temperatures out here. Minus 10, minus 11. So this is an early wake-up call for a winter that has not begun. Now, this type of powerful earthquake is more common than previously thought, and we are due for a big one. What are we talking about? Well, it's called a super shear earthquake, and they are caused when faults beneath the surface rupture faster than the earthquake waves responsible for shaking can actually move through the rock. Now, researchers at UCLA say at least one large earthquake that happened in Southern California was a super shear earthquake, and it happened in 1979 in the Imperial Valley, just south of the U.S.-Mexico border. It caused extensive damage to irrigation systems and injured dozens, though no deaths were reported, thankfully. Now, Meng and his fellow researchers looked at all the 6.7 plus magnitude earthquakes on strike slip faults, and they were searching for evidence of super shear earthquakes. And what they found is that the applicable 87 quakes since the year 2000, 12 of them were super shear. 
They were previously believed to only account for just 6% of all strike slip quakes. However, with the new findings, researchers have found that those violent super shear quakes happen more than twice as often. In fact, 16, 14% of all strike slip earthquakes in this region were sh super shear. And I quote, this is, you know, still rare, but not that rare according to Mang. And it was pretty surprising to the earthquake community. So super shear earthquakes coming to California with a 14% probability. Seismic update. We have had an uptick globally. The global seismic activity level went off the charts over the last five days with a triple red bar. This is unprecedented. If you look back at the last decade or so, it almost never happens where we have very high activity stacked together. And you can prove it to yourself by looking past the last decade by scrolling down from this link. So something may be afoot with the current activity level peaking. And we've had some major quakes all in the Tonga region, a 7.3, we've had a 7.0, and a 7.0, as well as a 6 magnitude here in Chile, 6.2 in Chile just in the last 24 hours. So over the last several days, we've had quite a bit of activity in this region. I wouldn't be surprised if a large 8 magnitude quake is setting up to sh shake Tonga. So keep your eyes on the Tonga region. Let's go over to volcanoes. All is quiet on the volcano front, except on Saturday, Popo had a quite spectacular eruption, just to 23,000 feet, but a plume like that is very, very photogenic. Now, a possible dike intrusion at Fagradosval volcano in Iceland. This is where the on and off activity of eruptions have been occurring for the last several years. Now, early in the morning of November 10th, which is three days ago, a swarm of earthquakes took place slightly north of the place where the eruption in August took place. So many people fear that this may be another, well, they don't fear, they actually want it to happen because it's a tourist attraction. Many people are thinking that this may be a new dike intrusion and maybe a setup for a new volcanic episode. But seismicity as a whole across Iceland is quite low and there's nothing imminent showing up on the seismos. Space weather news, let's take a look. We had a couple of nice sunspot groups moving across the disk. They perform weak, only giving us low-level uh, impulsive M flares, and then the sun has gone quiet again. And it's not looking very good for those who predicted that this cycle would be very strong. In fact, it is one of the weakest cycles in the last 100 years. It is now matching cycle 24 step by step. In fact, if we go into the detailed analysis, it is in fact weaker than cycle 24. Cycle 24 began right before the year change from 2008 to 2009. Here, this line depicts the minimum between 23 and 24. And one, two, three years later, which is this here, we had a peak of 140 sunspots three years in to cycle 24. Here we are at cycle 25, one, two, three years in, and we have yet to come up above 98 sunspots. So cycle 24 at the same time had already seen 140 sunspots, where at the same point in cycle 25, we are still at 98. So cycle 25 currently is weaker than 24, and this graph is, well, not really showing it all that well. This one is. So thems are the facts. Supernova anniversary, famous Tycho star flared up 450 years ago this month. The nova far outshone every star in the night sky and could even be readily seen through the brilliance of the blue daytime sky. Is this the source of many petroglyphs? Well, probably. One of the most spectacular celestial sights ever seen suddenly appeared in the northern night sky 450 years ago this month. A new star in the constellation Cassiopeia the Queen, and it was the most brilliant nova ever recorded in 500 years. To this day, it remains one of the only five known supernovas observed in the Milky Way galaxy. Pretty fantastic. Now, did you hear the sonic booms? Maybe you did if you were in Florida. This was the top secret X-37B plane making a landing. And in fact, it had been up in space for like 900 days, I think. Let me see if I can get a number here. I can't find it. Well, take my word for it. 
Dozens of sonic booms reported surface as the X-37B, a robotic military spacecraft that looks like a miniature space shuttle, followed an eastern path across the state and eventually landed at KSC's launch and landing facility. All told, the 30-foot spaceship spent 908 days in low Earth orbit, shattering the previous record of 780 days. So this is an autonomous drone that's been flying up in space via remote control for almost three years. Creepy. Now, some scientists tested Einstein's theory of gravity on the scale of the universe, and guess what they found? Yeah, it's a little hokey. They found interesting hints of a possible mismatch with Einstein's predictions. Albeit, these had a rather low statistical significance, but this does mean that there is nevertheless a possibility that gravity works differently at large scales and that the theory of general relativity may need to be tweaked. In fact, the study also found that it's very difficult to solve the Hubble tension problem by only changing the theory of gravity. So, the full solution would probably require a new ingredient to the cosmological model. Hmm, perhaps electricity. What say you? <laughs> Here's the paper, Imprints of Cosmological Tensions in Reconstructed Gravity, Came out in October this year on the 27th, so brand new paper, go get it. The evolution of tree roots may have driven mass extinctions. This is all the way back in the Devonian, which is the geologic time period right after the one that I studied, the Silurian. Now, the analysis show. so let's just give you some context. Back in the Silurian, which is about 420 million years ago, the first grasses and plants made their way up onto the shorelines. And shortly after that in the Devonian, we have proto-trees and roots. And this analysis shows that the evolution of these tree roots likely flooded ancient oceans with excess nutrients. And this would cause a massive algal bloom. And these rapid and destructive algal blooms would have depleted most of the oxygen on Earth at that point. There wasn't much oxygen yet. And this would have triggered catastrophic mass extinctions. And in fact, that's what we see. The Devonian period between 419 and 358 million years ago, which is prior to the evolution of most life on land, is known for mass extinctions in the sea, during which it is estimated that nearly 70% of all life, millions of species, perished. So, thank you, tree roots. Now, make a wish another tarred fireball re-enters. And this one is over Utah. And it is quite a nice-looking bolide. It almost looks like it's either full moon or dusk. So... Events like these during the Younger Dryas probably numbered in the millions all at once over a short period of time. So that is quite fantastic. And it's not over yet, kids. You still have time to see some of those Taurid fireballs. In fact, the Taurid fireballs may peak this evening just below the Pleiades. Here you can see the Pleiades and the midnight sky right above your head. And if you look just below it, that's where the northern Taurids come from. And they peak between the 11th and the 13th is what I think they claim here. Now they say they peak on the 12th, but this year many scientists are claiming they're going to peak on the 14th. So get out and look up tonight below Pleiades if it's clear out. And even tomorrow morning, the best time to see the Taurids is around midnight to about 4 a.m. So get out and look up. What, what is a meteor storm? Well, it's exactly what we're seeing here. And this is the fragmentation of Comet 73P that we witnessed back in 2006, otherwise known as schwachmann wachmann which is very hard to say. 73P was broken up in its orbit and captured. And what you can see here is that the cometary body broke up into hundreds of large chunks and within this field, there are probably millions of smaller cometary pieces of debris. And so an event like this would be similar to the event that happened during the Younger Dryas. And all of these pieces re-entered and made it to the surface of Earth, creating, well, wreaking havoc on the surface and eliminating the last advanced culture 
in an instant. And yes, a Pennsylvania state representative was reelected after his death. This is not fake news. This is clear evidence of the state of our nation. When tens of thousands of people can vote for a man who has been dead for a month, it shows that they don't know who they're voting for, nor do they care. They're simply pushing a button for the party that they support. They don't care about the candidate. They have no idea what the candidate supports, what their platform is, or what they stand for. But they've been brainwashed by the mainstream media to do what they're told. So they vote for a dead man. And that's a boon to knowledge. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. I hope you didn't vote for a dead man. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people. Become a Patreon. Support the work we do. I work my ass off for you guys. We love you. Be safe.